Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and uh, it's an honor to be joined today by a uh, gifted bassist and, uh, like most of the cats that I interview, a better human being, Larry Klein. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, be doing this with you. Me too. I, you know, I, I told you I, I had, um, I had a conversation with Steve Swallow, mm -hmm. and he was talking about. Going to the precursor of the Nam show, I, he didn't remember the name of it, but he was there with Burton. Mm -hmm. This is going back to the late '60s thereabouts, and um, they were doing 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off, playing these sets. And he was playing upright, and he was still in that jazz sort of. I got to play the upright. I got to play the upright. And he had um, gotten pretty bored after a couple of hours, and he started to peruse the Fender bass section, and then he got to the Gibson section, and when nobody was looking, he ducked in to the Gibson base, uh, to that uh, to that area, uh, and he uh, picked up an electric base, and he, his brain was saying no, 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 but his hands were saying this feels completely right. And what I wanted to ask you about, as, as an omnivore in music that you are, can you talk about the first time you picked up the electric base? And how it felt in your hands, and then as a subset to that, how you dealt with integrating an instrument that was always rejected in jazz. Because Gary, that's been a lifelong issue for Steve, mm -hmm. is trying to tr trying to get people to understand that it's a beautiful instrument to play in jazz. So, did you have a similar experience? Because you know you got the upright right behind you. When did you pick up the electric? What did it feel like? And then, have you? Did you ever have those experiences where you were, you've been dealing with trying to fit it into the jazz idiom? Well, I kind of came from the next, I guess, or well, certainly the next from Steve Swallow. He was one of my heroes, you know, as a kid starting to play. But I came into it sort of in a, in a different trajectory in that I started out playing guitar and and I'd say the, the, the very first thing that, uh, that made me want to play guitar, I would say was a mixture of Bob Dylan and the Beatles. And, and, and you know, probably the Beatles were the, the, the sort of initial hook that that caught me, you know, like in where I thought, oh my God, this is amazing to do this, to, to sit and make sound and make, you know, and play songs and, and, you know, just that initial burst of adrenaline that you have to have that, as a kid that makes you want to do things. So I was about seven or six or seven when, when that happened. And so I started playing guitar and then, uh, the way that I went over to bass was also probably a pretty uh, archetypal kind of um, uh, journey in that in that I was you know I had other friends and we were started playing together and someone had to play bass right you know like, like, I mean you got a bunch of guitar players and a drummer and, someone had to play and, bass and someone someone has to play bass and I, I I looked at it you know someone had a Fender bass and I thought ah. Let me try that, you know. And what and, year was this? Uh, this would have been nineteen. Let's see. Maybe around nineteen seventy. So the first bass was an uh, electric bass. Uh, is that true? Yes, it was probably nineteen seventy or nineteen sixty nine. My, my first bass was an, a Fender bass, yeah. And so, um, once I got a hit of what it was like to be in that position in a group and play play bass, I, I, right away I got it. I, th I, I thought, wow, this is a really cool position to, to be in in a, in a musical group. You know, it, it, you're sort of at the fulcrum of the thing, you know, between rhythm and melody and harmonic content and and, and uh, 
and a, a real position of power in a certain way and where you can kind of steer things in a way. And um, so I started studying and really learning electric bass. Um, and then it wasn't, it wasn't very long before um, once I started playing electric bass where I, before I thought, uh, you know, I was looking at, uh, you know, uh, jazz groups and, and, and also classical music and I thought, whoa, okay, if I'm on this tack, if I'm going down this road, I got to do the real thing and, and so I managed to get a, a plywood bass, uh, you know, uh, upright bass. And, and, um, and that, of course, opened up, you know, like a whole other world to me. And, you know, I started studying um, how to play that instrument right. And that affected, of course, also affected my electric bass playing. You know, I, I was learning the proper way of doing things. And I started studying both both with a, a, a great teacher who recently passed away here in LA. Um, I started studying both electric bass and upright bass and, and with him and he was a guy named Herb Mickman and he, he taught a lot of people in Los Angeles through a, a number of years. And, um, and then I subsequently then studied piano with him as well. But he was a guy who came up in New York and was a, a friend of Bill Evans and, and Eddie Gomez and w w really came up during that era that those guys did. And Can you, uh, studied with Fred Zimmerman, who was one of the, like the principal bassist in the New York Philharmonic, and so he was he was a great teacher. And so 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 that so then I you know I, so I came through the tunnel of electric <laughs> bass to to upright bass. So and, fascinating. And, and then I started playing you know in community orchestras once I got enough together with the bow and 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 so I was just you know I was doing everything I was playing. In, in bands playing rock stuff, playing Beatles stuff, playing, you know, uh, music that was going on in East LA at that time, because that's where I grew Latin. up. Yeah, and, and then, and then, uh, and then I started playing in community orchestras and, you know, and sort of exploring that route. So, but I came from the electric bass to the upright bass. In one of our, uh, talking to Larry Klein here on the Jake Feinberg Show, live on Facebook, and uh, keep the comments coming and the shares coming, um, it's an honor to have you all here, but um, uh, in our second interview, you talked about going to festivals with Freddie, and there'd be cats that would look at you guys and say, well, you're not playing the real shit, okay, meaning bebop, mm -hmm. but did part of it also have to do with the fact that you weren't playing the upright? Mm. Well, I was sometimes. I, some, sometimes, de depending on what was going on, what kind of mood Freddie was in, uh, you know, at that time, you know, the main way to transport a, uh, an upright bass was buying a seat for it on the airplane. <laughs> and that was, a, as you can imagine, a pain in the ass for everybody <laughs> concerned. But, but, and also expensive, you know, for... for uh, Maybe sometimes the airlines would give a half fare or something like that for that, but 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 it was it was a it was a, a, something that was fraught with <laughs> all sorts of danger too because you, you know a lot of times you'd call and absolutely clear it with the airlines and clear it with everybody and then you'd you'd be wheeling your base up to the up to the door and the, and you'd have a flight attendant going. Mm -mm. Or the neck would be that broken ain't, off. That ain't going on my right. Body, wow. Know? And 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 um, so it was always an adventure in in uh, transport. <laughs> unpredictable <laughs> elements, you know. And 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 so sometimes sometimes I would have an upright, and then sometimes I'd play the whole gig on on electric. And 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 I mean, the, the bass players still confront. Of course, on the road, confront that where the, where they have to borrow bases from 
from players in the city that they're going to, and that's always an adventure too. And it much much easier now with with the internet and such, where people can actually, you know, communicate with with each other in in a more effective manner. But but uh, but a lot of times they, a base would be arranged in some Italian town for me to play, and I'd get there, and the, you know the strings would be like this far off the neck, and it, you know you it would be just a nightmare, you know. So that that would compel one to learn how to swing on the electric bass, and and um, and so. Uh, so it was always different, you know. Did did did, did did you feel though that I mean, can you talk to peeps about out there about how the electric bass absolutely can fit into the jazz idiom? A swallow was talking about being a it was a li it's been a lifelong challenge because he's he plays the electric now, sure. you know, and, and and to 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 not be for people that will actually listen to him about why it can fit into the, to the jazz idiom. I hate labels, but. I just wonder if that was. I know you're an omnivore and you play all types of music, but you, you know, with Freddie and stuff, did you feel like you had to? Have you been an, been an advocate for the, the electric bass? What would be your message to cats out there who say, "Oh, jazz, you have to play the acoustic. It's an acoustic music." What would you say to them as it relates? To oh, the I, I don't think you have to do anything. I think that thinking that way is restrictive. Number one, you know, and, and number two. I think that sometimes going against those kind of impulses is what guides you towards something fresh. You know, I, 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 I would say, you know, the natural, intu the, the natural impulse is on something that is jazz oriented is to go to the upright bass, right? right. Well, I, I was just doing, I was working on something on the, on a record that I'm working on right now. And, 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 and um, I, I'm, I'm playing bass on the record, and 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 it, it was a situation that came up that was exactly that, where where normally you would go to the acoustic bass, where I thought, hmm, you know what, it might be kind of interesting to, <laughs> to 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 go at this with a very round kind of funky kind of round sound on the electric bass and 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 that's that world is certainly one in which you know which Steve Swallow was a pioneer and and of course you know you rediscover territory that people have navigated through all the time because music is such a wide uh, and, and expansive thing but but I but I, I sort of came to that Steve Swallow <laughs> you know, a little uh, spark of an idea in the context of this record, where I thought nah, I'm going to go opposite the, the normal impulse and, and go this way, and it really it, it ended up working really well for me. And so, I, yeah, I, I I I think that I think that whenever um, people have some kind of ironclad rule like that, that that that, that, that that it's good to approach it with a fresh eye. I, th I think, uh, and I think that a lot of a lot of people would agree with. Yeah. That, you know. Um, I wanted to ask you about. It could be in any context, but I was listening to Pete Townsend uh, from the Who. Going this going back thirty forty years, and he was talking about they had been playing the same set for four years. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know the audience is coming to either hear exactly what's on the record. Or it's just a formula trip where it's just the same thing mm -hmm. every night. And it was a burn. It got to be a burn. Mm -hmm. Have you been in situations like that? And and I, cause I, and can you talk about maybe the idea of being with someone like Freddie where you didn't know what you were going to play? Truly, the, the the set lists were not mapped out in advance because the formula trip is very high. A lot of younger cats, they go to concerts now expecting to hear exactly the way the things sounded on the record. Mm -hmm. And it's very predictable. But that's not what, in, at least in the melodic set, in the, you know, 
could you just talk about the idea of not knowing what you were going to play and how that can create, how the level of coincidence can go up when you start to improvise like that, when you start to connect with everybody in the band? Well, I, I think that it can work a number of ways, you know, and there, there are a number of different ways to creatively approach it and think about it, you know. Uh, I think that, that for me, uh, playing in a situation like it, like you're saying that it was with Freddie was it was great and fan, it was exactly what I needed at that time in that it was so wide open you know like and and, and he you know if you did something if you tried something in in the context of uh, of a song that was just completely different <laughs> either you know what either either it worked great or or it didn't work and 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 you know everyone would know it you know when you when you do it and but when it did work and other people kind of uh and the audience knew it, it enabled it to work architecturally like by what they played then it you know there's a fantastic moment of discovery like where whoa man we just what look what we just came across you know um so there's that kind of thing when you have no boundaries and no guidelines as to what you have to do but then you know also i have to say like when you do know what songs you're playing and and you do and you have a a lot of predetermined structure to everything there's still a lot of room to uh to, to my mind to to experiment and to hone and you know i, I mean i'm trying to think can of you give things. an example of how you learn like, that because like, I, I want people to know that there's that that things can be straight there can be elasticity within the formula well for example for me um what year was it, it was in the 80s like maybe i'd say probably around maybe 88 or 89 or so um i did uh Oh, uh, you know, bass, another bass player that I revered and still do, really, uh, Lee Sklar, ha ha he was playing... Lee? He was playing with, with, of course, he was playing with James Taylor at this time, and then, and then he was also playing with Phil Collins, and he, he had a difficult thing where, where he was on the road with Phil, and then, so James was playing a... Um, a gig, the Prince's Trust gig, and 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 so he asked me to fill in for Lee, and of course I was just really excited about this, and so uh, you hadn't played with him before. No, I'd never played with him before, and 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 um, and so you know we rehearsed a little bit. I just learned the material. I knew most of it anyhow because just I loved the record so much, um, but. But this just came to mind coincidentally when that we're talking about this. You know, here, you know, you learn the structure that he's playing these songs with, you know, and it's a given structure. He, he's got, you know, he knows what he's doing pretty much, and everybody has been playing these songs on the road. And I just kind of slipped into the group, right? Well, but, but. It was so vivid because it was only maybe a week and a half or so that this period that I did this, but within that, I I remember thinking, wow, there is just so much room for subtle refinement and and you know he's a, every night he's singing things a little bit differently and 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 giving a different inflection to a, a phrase or something that he plays on guitar, and I remember. You know, and and so I'm gradually through this period seeing what works on my end around his vocal best. That what so these things, and it's more. It's kind of you, you could make a, a comparison or a a similar phenomenon. I think would be like a, a actor who learns a play and who's doing a play, and that they do the same lines every night and they do the same gestural things generally. But they refine them over the course of 
the play and, and, it, and they find things, little timing things within the, the given dialogue that it works great to pause here and, and then to look over to the side and do this creates a <laughs> moment and and so you, you find moments right you know? and so so the same thing i think is true you know whether you're playing a completely set show it can get down to very finite things like note length you know like oh what if i play what if i play this long and and kind of with a legato underneath what the singer is doing and you know that might work well and then you th it either works or it doesn't and then so there's there's like you know you're taking the 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 refinement or experimentation thing into a very finite continuum if you're if you're playing uh, a pre-existing song sequence and uh, as opposed to something like Freddy where, where it's 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 just a open palette you know? Larry, I wanted to ask you, I, I, was, I happened to be transcribing my interview with Tom Scott, and he mentioned that uh, when Joni discovered the LA Express and they started to do albums, she had actually never recorded with a live band in the studio. She had done, she'd bring in a piano player for, to do their part, and then a guitar player you know, to sing with her, and then they'd bring in a rhythm section. So can you talk about when you first started working with her, what that was like? Did you do sing individual parts with her, or did you work with her with a full band? Well, this, of course, was after the L.A. Express period, and and, uh, and I was brought in by John Guerin. Um, the man. Who was a very, you know, big, important figure for me um, in my musical development, and also in every way. He was... He was um, really a great force in my life musically you know and 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 someone who was one of my big mentors and and so uh but but the the initial dates that we did with her were just John myself and her and pretty sure of that. And, so it was just bass drums. And, and her playing guitar and singing. And, um, and we, you know, on those, that initial uh, group of songs, she, she hadn't written enough songs for an album yet on, on that particular record. And, and so she, so we went in first and she, I think maybe only had two songs or so to, to record. And so we did like maybe four days of recording, and then and then she needed to go off and write some more, and so she she write like three more, and we'd come back. And she was months. able to crank out songs that quickly, or well, no, I mean over the you know there would be like a couple of months in right, between, right, 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 and um and so but it was episodic, and 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 uh, I don't remember completely whether it started getting fleshed out a little bit more as far as the number of players but I, I remember mostly it just being the three of us um, playing did you um, we were talking off air but I wanted you to go into this 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 uh, album that uh, from 2007 which was interpretations of Joni's music mm -hmm. uh, that you worked with Herbie Wayne ultimately played some concerts with Dave Holland as well but I I am I want oh, you to Dave was on the on the record. Uh, Dave was on the record. He was the bass player. These are three of your idols obviously, mm -hmm. but could you just take us through the entire process of sort of ringing out the to make sure where they were at and how you realized that there there needed to be more resonance and how you got it through to them and how their reactions how they how they took it and how it eventually got to the point where it was satisfactory. Well, so Herbie and I had sat for quite a few months, um, a number of months anyhow, uh, going over potential songs for the for the record and going over the lyrics and and you know that seemed to be sort of the first step to me and him too, uh, you, you know to to understanding how to to 
put together a sequence of songs that really captured uh, the the distinctive and original and 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 special quality of Joni's songwriting and what she does musically and 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 um, and so and Herbie had said to me at the beginning of the process that he he didn't generally really listen to words in in songs you know and of course he came out of the era where you were playing standards and you, you know if you listen if you if you played Star, Stella by Starlight <laughs> you didn't necessarily know the lyrics that's right that, and, and it was a good point it wasn't a huge part of uh, what what most musicians would would pay attention to so um, uh, so we got into very deep into talking about each each line of what songs lyrics. would you play for him, Joni songs? Oh well, you know, uh, I went over her whole catalog and kind of narrowed it down to songs that I felt would best um, be suited to interpretation with in, in a jazz setting and also potentially in an instrumental setting because uh, we didn't know or at the outset we didn't know how many songs were going to be approached with a with with a vocalist and how many would be just instrumental versions of the song with with the group of musicians and so so I narrowed it down but there's still a lot of songs I mean that we were had in the basket to examine and and um, and um, well, some of them, the, the, you know, like certainly Edith and the Kingpin was one that for me jumped out from the outset. There were certain songs that that felt like they needed to be there because of the the prominence that they had in in the world regarding her songwriting, like Both Sides Now. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, we also another one of the considerations was trying to get a cross section uh, chronologically of of things that she had done in, in different periods of her career, and and so there was an emphasis on chronology, though. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we, you know, there were a lot of different things, and and then part of it was just an, an intuitive sort of feeling between Herbie and I that that oh, this is a good one to to fit into the collection and. Let's do this one. Um, um, uh, of course, uh, a case of you was was another one that we felt strongly about. There, there was a, uh, of the more recent things. There was a song called Harlem in Havana, which I think now is, I think it just came out on one of the, in one of the digital formats of the record. But now they just released this tenth anniversary thing. Which is which, which kind of brought some of the digital only records onto the main CD and and uh, as a as part of it, and that one, which that that one just naturally felt like one we had to do. Um, uh, I had a king is another one that was was just on the digital in the digital format, um, and, and, and so. You know, and in the end, we also opened it up a little bit, and felt that we both felt that it would be interesting to include uh, a couple of songs that were important songs musically, or and or lyrically, you know. Um, that weren't hers that, that that she didn't write, and so we we ended up doing a version of Wayne's Nefertiti, uh, and then we ended up doing a version of Solitude as well. Yeah, just uh, this is important because uh, someone just asked, why what was the if you could uh, how did how did that song have an impact on Joni Nefertiti? Oh, you know, as as it did. Yeah, well, on, I, on, on, on all of us, it, it was just the. The way in which they did it, yeah. Uh, for a song to to um, you know the, the the architecture of it and the and the 
construction of the way that they approached it where it was just the re repetition of this melody and, and and just the changing landscape behind and and in the way that it's presented was you know it was kind of earth shattering <laughs> the, the, the way that that th thing hit all of us when it came out and and I remember when I first heard it it turned my head inside out you know and and I'm sure she was the same like you know this this angular kind of beautiful melody against these chords and 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 everything just sort of swirling in chaos around it you know and to and and then Miles and Wayne just stating this melody shadowing each other so what would you know I the the idea that we ended up coming up with as a way to um, re re-examine it and bring something fresh to it was instead of uh, you know the normal thing you would think of would be would be maybe stating the melody of it clearly and then and then having people solo over it right. and then coming back to the melody per, per, right. maybe well that felt you know like not only would it be boring in, in, in comparison with the way that I mean, you know you're you're when you reinterpret a, a song like that that's been recorded so definitively, you're up against a very difficult uh, <laughs> proposition. And so, so the the idea that we ended up uh, coming up with was to 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 present the thing from at the beginning completely diffused, and and where you know all your you just got this kind of pointillistic series of fragments in fact i think i think that the recording starts with vinnie just playing and, and vinnie so, you. yeah and so you just have drums kind of implying a tempo and and in a very broken way and then things start kind of tumbling in from different instruments <laughs> and, and then as it goes on you there's this conversation that that ensues with Wayne and Herbie and Dave Holland and Vin and 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 then it gradually coalesces coalesces until the way that the track ends is with a clear presentation of the melody and 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 so at the end yeah so we thought that well that's that's an interesting thing to do it's a different way of approaching it and and I I felt like we we captured something something different and new to to a different way to to present that great song of Wayne's you know do, do, just to talk to peeps out there that you know like you said you're you were sort of coordinating this you were the head honcho on this album and yeah, yeah. and and then well you, could, I, I was one I was no I mean I you yeah, know but, I was, but I mean you were you, you can you were well, you just were talking off air I thought it was really important you were talking about going through the tunes and realizing that, well, I want you to, in your own words, talk about it wasn't cutting the mustard, so to speak, and you had to somehow get it across to these guys that it needed to go deeper. And I, and I wanted you to maybe give an example of how you got them to open their minds and then ultimately, I mean, just take us through that. Well, I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, I, no. I, 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 I would phrase it a little different. Yeah, yeah, but, don't. But, but here, here's, here, here was a, the dilemma that I was... The, yeah, the, the, the dilemma. Take okay, us through it. Was, yeah. was the... the, the, the Herbie and I had sit, sat together um, through a period of months, actually, you know, coming up with ideas and developing the same A record like that record is 90% pre production and then 10% actually doing it because the, the doing of it is, is rather fast in a way. You know, right. Like, the, like working with a group of great musicians like those guys. And then, but then, then after that, we had to put the in the in most cases we had to put the singers on after the fact. In some cases, like Nora Jones sang live with them, but that was a rarity. So, um, but the the thing that was a, an odd situation as a person in the role of the producer 
for me was that here I was going to the studio every day in New York City um, and you know working with these guys who you know Dave and, and, and Wayne and Herbie were were heroes of mine and, and people who set the standard and people who who were so instrumental to me in, in developing myself musically and and I'm in there and I have to um, you know I have to do my my job is to kind of shepherd the thing to completion um, in a way that is gonna that is not only gonna get at what Herbie wants to get at but but is also to me uh, going to, is something that's gonna open fresh territory and also hold up to posterity and because it's a very um well you gotta live with you gotta live with it of, you gotta live with it forever and it's, and a it's an auspicious thing to you know be making this thing absolutely of Joni's music with these guys so so you know I was up against a, a situation where we would go through a song and and many many times one or the other of those guys would would say well we went to we played it. That, that, that's that's great, right? You know, and I I'd have to be the one who who said, well, I th you know we're 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 on the trail. You know, we're on the trail to it. But I feel like there's some more something more that we can get at if, if we do this and this and this and change. What's this, this and this and that? I mean, this well, well, sometimes it was sometimes it was a an approach to how the how the track developed. Yeah. How the, how the you know, architecturally, sometimes it was very finite things like, you know, like, you know, uh, at a certain point in, in the song, you know, exactly what notes Dave would play underneath a, a given line of melody or, or something like that, you know, uh, and it was all different. I mean, you know, and to a certain extent, like, like Wayne, for example, always, always thinks theatrically and dramatically, you know, like about how, I think, so sometimes, I remember one time he, like on Edith and the Kingpin, I remember him saying, I'm the guy at the bar watching, you know, and... and He's playing his character. Right, and yeah. I thought, perfect, man, that's, that's <laughs> exactly what you should be, you know, I think. And, and, um, uh, and so, you know, there would be those kind of things where my job really was to watch and at crucial junctures redirect things a little bit just by nudging them one way or, or the other and and you know these were guys who are used to recording a lot of the time just first takes you know and so they weren't always so happy to hear <laughs> You know, yeah. the the, the uh, you know the opinion of the the little guy. You know, this. I mean, they were all friends, and, obviously, and, and 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 you know, but but they weren't always that happy to hear my suggestions, and um, but I had to. You know, I remember coming home, you know, coming back to the hotel room and just thinking. Oh, God, this is agonizing, you know, like having to do this, you know, having to be in this position. And then, um, but, uh, but I remember on, on one song, I think it might have been uh, Amelia, it was, it was a difficult one to get to feel right and to get for things to work out right. And I remember, uh, you know, that we, that was one that we worked at for quite some time and, and, and I was suggesting different things and everybody was kind of getting used to the structure and, and whatnot. And then I remember uh, there being one spot where I thought Dave should, should just sort of lay one note out and, not, and, and leave space or something like that. And after we had been working on it for a number of hours and, and, and I got on the talk back and and said, so Dave, you know, um, <laughs> what if we, what if we did this in, in you know, like just laid a note there long and whatnot. And, and 
there was just no response. And so I knew that I, I had kind of reached the, the, I reached the limit of, of how much <laughs> I should how say. Many days, how this. many days were, because those guys are all first take guys. I mean, even mm -hmm. when, when Holland first came to New York City uh, to join Miles, he ran through a couple of tunes and then he was on the bandstand. Right. So, I mean, how many days did you spend in the studio? Oh, not that many. I mean, you know, we, I think for the whole record, we probably worked four or five days. Silence from know. Holland on that, though. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, that, and, and you know, uh, okay, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to present the idea until I hit a brick wall, and that, that was, for him, was the brick wall, and, and I love the guy and think that he's such a, he's a legend, amazing, yeah. and a great music, cat, musician, yeah. and great person, and, uh, in every way, and, and, uh, I think, if I sat down with him, I don't think I ever talked to him about it, but I think we would laugh about it now. But, uh, um, but so that, that was a very difficult thing to do because you, you find yourself in a position where, where, you know, a Zen teacher would say, well, that's your job, man. You know, like, you know, you right. got to do your job. That's right. So even so, though it's intimidating at times, or, it's, yeah. or I don't know if that's the right word, but you do, you oh, don't want to, you it's don't, not the most pleasant thing to be the harbinger uh, uh, that we have to do it more, you know. How have you more. felt, how have you become more comfortable in that role over uh, time? And, 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 and who was someone that you mentored you, maybe even you didn't know it at the time? Oh, I had some great uh, producer mentors. You did. People who I thought were great at the job. Um, Daniel Lanois, I thought... I've always thought was a, a wonderful um, uh, example of a of a guy who brought something great in, in, in to that job. Um, uh, gee, well, you know, I, I'd say a lot of the producers, oh, a number, quite a number of producers, I, I thought did the job well, but. But I, but I also worked for a lot of producers who I thought did did not do the job well. So that was you learned what not to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I learned things not to do, and then and then and then uh, the work that I did with Joni certainly taught me a lot of things about how to things to avoid or th how to try and do that, be in that position in a in the right way and 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 so i think that it's a hard thing to describe exactly what makes a, a good producer because it changes the job changes with every situation you do it in because because of the individual needs of the artist and the nature of the music and the nature of the whole situation and and all the variables are always shifting from record to record, so you have to you have to discern the landscape of what your job is on each thing in a different way. And and the best thing that I've, as a generality, discovered is that it is that you try and promote a, a an atmosphere. That you know, not a, a non hierarchical atmosphere where where basically the the situation is one where you know we're a number of friends who are trying to to find something great you know like and, and discover something and you know so I you know I really like it I, I mean my, my favorite times doing the job is when is when, um, it, you know, rather than someone finishing a day of work in the studio and saying, oh, you know, Larry Klein is, is well, what a great producer. I'd much rather, I think it's much healthier <laughs> for the music, yeah, it's yeah, much yeah. healthier, and for everything, if, if everybody goes home just saying to themselves, wow, I just, I played really well, and, and I think I, I think I, I played my ass off and, and, and just, you know, we, we made something beautiful today, you know. And, and, and the way to do that is always different depending on the personalities and, and the music and the artist. And so, so it's, a, 
it, it's a it's an it's a very uh, difficult thing to describe how to do, and I'm, in fact, I'm doing some here and there doing master classes and things, and, and the only way that I can think of to teach it to people, at least my way of approaching it, is to actually do it, you know, and, 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 and actually have a group of young people who, who want to check out the way that I approach the job and, and, and do, do it, produce a song with a, with a group of people with you where they can stop you and, and ask you, well, why did you do this? Or why did you say that at this point? Um, and, and sometimes you, know, you might say to them, I don't know why. Well, you know, I would imagine, I, I usually have a, Re I mean, I have mean, a reason yeah. in my mind of, of, okay, the reason why I went over and said this to this, to the drummer is that I felt, I, I, I felt that, you know, something wasn't working on the bottom of the track or, you know, there's always a, a little germ of a, of a, of an idea that, or something that hits me where I'm after something different. And I, and, and even the way that I present it is specific to that moment in the day and, and what's going on usually, unless I'm, fucking up, which is, <laughs> hopefully is not the case, you know, I mean, you can't do it, you can't do the job perfectly, you know, you, you always have moments when you make, uh, make a choice, and it's, and it's, you realize, oh, I could have said that better, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, this was something that caught my attention last time, I, I need you to tell the audience about the first time that you were able to see Jim Keltner and Albert Stinson play Jazz. Oh, I didn't. Well, well, I didn't. I never saw them. Because I just want to be clear with the audience. Larry Klein calls Jim Keltner the Elvin Jones of rock. Yeah, I, I never saw those guys play together. I, I heard them play. You heard? What do you mean? You heard? You, you uh, heard? They because they, they. I mean, Keltner played with with Bobby Hutcherson and Woody Shaw at the both end. I, I just. Uh, see, Stinson I also played with Miles. That was recorded. But I'm just kind of. Well, Stinson played. I heard Stinson maybe the first time I heard him. I think. Was with John Handy, um, Larry Coryell record or something. Wow. I think it could have been. Wow. But I don't think Keltner was on there. I, I can't remember uh, where I, but I did hear them play together. But I spoke with Jim quite a bit, and I've played with him on different sessions and such. But but we've talked about Stinson, and and he had you know that was a very important relationship to. For him, you know, he he loved playing with Stinson, and and he, he he told me stories about that period and stories about Albert. And um, well, him, he said that him and Bobby used to keep Albert alive. Uh, he yeah. was ODing a lot, or you know, getting strung out. They have to walk him around the block, or you know, get him to the emergency room. But yeah. the dude was, I guess, the, the overarching thing is how did those guys like Keltner and I'm going to leave so many people out here, but. It, the cats that were that came up jazz fanatics, how did they help the rock music of that time breathe with their jazz and flex? Because they already had that jazz background in your mind. I mean, as opposed to just being a straight four four drummer, just being a rock drummer. How did the jazz influence the studio sounds of the, John Garren's another example? Yes. Okay. So, could you talk about in, in lay terms how that jazz influence? Affected all those incredible rock country records of the seventies. I think they brought guys who 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 came out of a jazz background brought a more elastic approach to to the way that they approached uh, rock records or or pop records. Even they, you know, there's a there's a certain elasticity that characterizes the best, uh, you know. The best rhythm and blues playing, you know, or the and and also I think to some extent the best playing on on uh, a lot of types of records, and someone like Jim, uh, I mean, he has such an uh, elastic kind of concept to the way that he he approaches things musically, 
he really brought a different thing to me. I mean, it, it always strikes me every time I hear him play that where, where you think, in the same way that you would think when you watch Elvin play, yeah. is he going to make it? Oh, man, he made it. Okay, you know, like, so, you know, in fact, you know, sometimes they don't know how they're going to make it out of a fill or how they're going to make it across a, 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 a the cusp of some sort of structural uh, elighting uh, situation. Um, but they do, you know, and, and it's just instinct and, and, and pure chance sometimes. Right. You know? And so I think that guys who, you know, whether it's a an R and B player who just learned how to play by doing it, or um, or a jazz player who's dealt with structure in a different way, I think that I think that elasticity is, is has something to do with it. You know, I, I, the the way and and also intuition and the way that you you. Um, do certain things. There's so many choices to make in a in a given track when you're when you're playing something. You know, note length and and how you approach uh, uh, making the arc of the song work and and how you how you create tension and all these things. And and, and so I think that someone who comes from a jazz background sometimes has has a more open concept of how to do that. You before I let you go, I just wanted you to talk about uh, maybe uh, one one tune or how closely, how much Joni Mitchell loved the the jazz musicians, the the, the songs, and also the respect that she had for the cats themselves. You could just take Mingus or any song that talk about one song that she loved and why she was so dedicated to those guys. I you know I think that. That uh, um, you know her. I'd say to a large extent, her her um, scale of of what she loved or loves, and what hit her uh, profoundly was determined by a combination of all sorts of factors, you know, the, mo the, 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 the biggest of which was she would listen and, and if something, if the tone and the instinctual way that a musician played touched her, you know, and that, that, that would, was, was the gold, you know, mm. like, in, you know, like a, a guy who, you know, like, I mean, I, the first thing I think of, and I think that she would bring up is Miles and, and how, you know, you hear, for instance, at one of, one of the times he recorded, it never entered my mind. The, the, the one that I think of, which was, I think, a prestige session, he, you know, he ends this, it's such a, a um, emotionally honest way of presenting the melody, and he ends the thing with this flat note that is just so flat. But to the theater of the song, it gives. If you if you if you look at the words of that song, you know some of some of it's kind of corny, and and it's not you know, <laughs> you know but but it's a gorgeous kind of when you hear this the melody against against uh the fabric harmonic fabric of the thing it's a great song and, and it was such a great vehicle for him you know and what he did with it with red garland playing that arpeggiated kind of thing through it and then and then to to bring out the sadness of of that song was amazing and 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 then to let it let that painfully flat note sit there for the for the final record you know that just blew her mind and blows my mind and it makes me want to cry too you know like and and i think i think that hearing that in someone's playing like johnny hodges she always 
said, I think I know that his playing moved her immensely, and and um, uh, Wayne's playing is always exciting and and inspirational to her as it is to me. You know, like because he because he he when he plays around lyric, he plays poetry. You know, he plays what's going on in the poetry of the song and, and very, was she hip to like very the, few people do that you know was she hip to like the Canadian like Oscar Peterson or Lenny Bro did she love those guys too or no, just, no not, not especially yeah. she, she, she you know she, I think you know she was drawn to emotional players and p players who who probably played who invented their own language sure. you know like like you know the Someone like Oscar, who was, of course, amazing and incredibly technically proficient and played stuff that, you know, you'd think, like, God, how can someone play like that? <laughs> like, like, like Art Tatum. Like, Art Tatum would not be someone that she would connect with, really, you know, and, and as great as it is, right? But, and some of it was just, it's just in the way that she hears things and, you know, she was never a big train fan, for, for example. She still isn't, I think. And and, and uh, we used to have interesting talks about that, you know, like, and I'd say, well, don't you hear this side of his playing? And, and it just didn't touch her. It's personal, you know, it's a lot of his personal. Yeah. The, 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 um, um, and Mingus, she was not initially. A fan of his music, you know. What was the, think, what turned? How I think it, it was a combination of his music, and even more who he was as a person, that that drew her into the thing, you know. I think. Um, you you uh, finished a an album about Bird, about mm -hmm. Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought one of the profound things that you talked about in our second radio interview was just the idea that the cats who generally are pioneers of the music of new language are not elitist and they don't they're omnivores of music mm -hmm. so just talk to the people out here that are that are watching that are tuning in but also people that might check this out in 10 years or 50 years what is something that people don't rec understand completely about Charlie Parker that you learned on this on this journey putting this together um or something that you want to hammer home to people that well, is important. Well, I, I think I, I think that the 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 um, the trajectory of his development as a musician and as a as a you know as a complete innovator. You know, I mean, here, here's someone who is in that exclusive class of being someone who reinvented. Jazz, really, you know, someone who explain why he, uh, reinvention. Explain. Well, that. I, I think that he came in when he started playing uh, out in public, for for instance. Uh, you know, he played with a different sound. His sound sounded thin, and to the to the older guys who he was playing with, and what he was getting at musically, even though it was in its uh, genesis. But when he was still in Kansas City, what he was playing, they didn't like, you know, and and it sounded it sounded bad to them, and and so he kind of really carried some scars from that, you know. And in fact, he he told his uh, his last wife Chan that he'd never wanted to go back to Kansas City. Just please, <laughs> I you know, I never want to go back there. And of course, that was where he ended up being buried wow. uh, because of. All sorts of reasons, but uh, but 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 the uh, I think that the, the angle at which we came at Charlie's story and his life uh, was that that he was kind of the archetypal Icarus kind of figure, you know, like he he came up and and because of all the circumstances in his life and who he was and whatever was in his soul, you know, he, he was just drawn to, to music in such a, you know, he lived for, 
for music and 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 um, I think the the configuration of who he was and how his uh, you know how his life unfolded is kind of a um, there's an ar archetype there you know of, of of being kind of the flame that burns too brightly and 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 so you know of course he you know he only lived to be I think 36 or so and 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 uh, and lived enough life in that span of time to fill you know ten other lifetimes for for people and and complete you know he completely reinvented jazz by by devising another way to play through chords and and uh, and 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 in doing so ended up you know I think people who live on that stratum uh, they they don't look at things in a in, in the same way you know and part of it is just being of a certain level of proficiency that is beyond hierarchy you know and and he you know he was he was a guy who was really looking to I mean he wanted to go to live in Europe and study with Nadia Boulanger and 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 uh, he was wanted to write music for orchestra he wanted to study also study with Edgar Varese he was he was he, he was you know I think my feeling is that he was kind of done with bebop in a certain way by the time that he in his last years you know I think he aspired to to a different frontier you know Larry Klein, it's so great to connect with you in person, man. Um, I hope people out there enjoyed this and uh, look forward to doing it again someday soon, man. Thank you. It's always a joy to talk to you. You're, you're incredibly perceptive and, uh, and uh, God, I, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. <laughs> All right. Take care. We'll be back later on the Jake Feinberg Show. Okay.